Church family, and we're also really glad to welcome you newcomers. Hey, we'd love to connect with you today. Would you consider sending us a message to let us know that you're worshiping with us? You can write to us at lcpc.net or on our LCPC Facebook page. Tell us what the Lord's doing in your life. Let us know how we might make online worship more effective. Well, now let's lift up our voices to our amazing God.
us praise. You deserve it all. You deserve it all. We give you the highest praise. You deserve it all. And you deserve it all. We give you the highest praise. You deserve it all. You deserve it all. We give every breath that's in my lungs. Our heart cries out to you, we want to help me. Good morning, and what a joy it is to celebrate uh, Sunday to worship our God together. We're really grateful that you chose to worship with us today. Hey, if you came to the name change meeting this last week, and we just want to say thank you. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for uh, letting your opinion be heard. Know that there's going to be another meeting after Easter where we're going to talk about the same subject, but we're really grateful to all of you who set aside time to come to that. One big announcement that we have uh, is that next Sunday at 4 p.m. is our annual meeting. It's a huge meeting. It's very important. We're going to be talking about uh, new deacons and elders. We're going to be talking about uh, finances. You'll hear reports from ministry directors like me uh, and more info on what's next for our church and for Pastor Andy. So please set aside time, uh, 4 p.m. next Sunday on the 21st. Make sure that you're there for that. Church family, we love you. We're so grateful that you're here worshiping with us this morning. Let's sing to the Lord. Though a 
scripture reading this morning is from Deuteronomy chapter 26 verses 12 to 15. When you have finished setting aside a tenth of all your produce in the third year, the year of the tithe, you shall give it to the Levite, the alien, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat in your towns and be satisfied. Then say to the Lord your God, I have removed from my house the sacred portion and have given it to the Levite, the alien, the fatherless, and the widow, according to all you commanded. I have not turned aside from your commands, nor have I forgotten any of them. I have not eaten any of the sacred portion while I was in mourning, nor have I removed any of it while I was unclean, nor have I offered any of it to the dead. I have obeyed the Lord my God. I have done everything you commanded me. Look down from heaven, your holy dwelling place, and bless your people Israel and the land you have given us as you promised on oath to our forefathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. The word of the Lord. In this hard season, the Lord's showing us just how badly the world needs his message of hope. But we can't be effective kingdom builders at this church or in any church unless uh, God's people are giving their financial gifts. So if you would please take time today to offer a gift, we'd be so grateful. You can give today at lcpc.net or maybe you could drop off or mail off a gift to the church office. Thanks for partnering with us in God's work. Let's pray now. Father God, the Lord of heaven and earth, when we open up our hearts to you in worship, we're overwhelmed by your goodness. We're also mindful of our brokenness and of all the ways that we fail you. We're awakened to our need for your grace and your mercy. We confess to you now our lack of faith. Too often we give in to fear. We don't trust you to take care of us. We don't live like people who share in your victory, Lord Jesus, over sin and death. We confess to you now our selfishness. Too often we organize our lives around worldly ambitions We ignore the suffering of the people around us. We don't love others as you do, Lord Jesus. We confess to you now our apathy and our indifference. Too often we just drift along. We allow the culture around us to shape our thoughts and our choices, our actions. We don't seek to understand your holy word. Our love for you is half-hearted. So forgive us, Lord Jesus. Take away our sin. Destroy our sin as you came and were sent by the Lord, by by God the Father to do. And by the power of your Spirit, give us the virtues that we need to grow in your character. Thank you, Holy God, for your grace and your mercy. So many in our church family are hurting today, and we know that all around the world people are are hurting in ways that are just uh, profound because of this pandemic. And we lift up to you all who are grieving the death of friends and family members. We praise you for the assurance that what lies ahead for those who love you is so much better than anything that has already been. 
Lord, we embrace that promise in this season. Lord, we lift up to you all in our church family who are sick. We ask you to move with power, to bring hope, to bring healing. You know the special needs of each of our friends, and we entrust each one to you. And uh, we know that you'll be touching their spirits and touching their bodies as we lift them up. Don and Mary Catherine Empey, Ron Ricketts, Robin Crabtree, Nancy Zahn, Pete Minkler, Jim Larson, Jolene Collins, Phil Van Horn, Christine Marks, Charles Hazelton, Carter Pollock. Lord, all over the world, so many are struggling to make ends meet. We know that there are famines that are developing in various places, that people are, are skipping meals and eating two or three times a week. Right here in Southern California, hundreds of thousands of people have lost jobs and businesses. And so many are homeless, and we see that on the streets all around us. People are losing hope. And so, God, would you bring comfort and healing? Would you bring supernatural provision in this great time of need? Lord, we pray for those right now who are praying along with us, who have a deep need. We pray, Lord, that you would open up the storehouse of your blessings and uh, show your power and show your love. Lord, give wisdom and strength to healthcare workers who are weary and, uh, Lord, who have been so uh, courageous in this season. We thank you for their work. We thank you for the good news that has been coming in really weekly now about the, the pandemic. We thank you, Lord, for these vaccines and the way that they're getting out to people. And we pray not only that in this nation that the vaccine uh, vaccination of people would, would be accelerated, but we pray that those vaccines would, would make uh, their way to people all over the world who are in uh, places of real desperation. Holy Spirit, we, we ask that, again that you'd bring revival to, you, to our churches, revival to your worldwide church. Lord, give us confidence in your care. We pray that as the gospel is preached, that hearts would be opened and softened and that people would receive you as their Savior, uh, would confess their sin and receive the new life that you have for them in your name. Lord Jesus, we need you. Holy Spirit, we seek your comfort, your guidance this day. And Father God, we love you and trust you. Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning is from Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 through 13. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. God's word for us this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in deepest need, in a need for your presence with us, in a need to have you make us whole, make us new creatures. Lord, we pray that your life would fill us in such a way that we live out your holiness in this world that is lost, that is dying. And we pray that the good news come not only in word, but in power, in the Holy Spirit, in full conviction. Amen. L.A. is right on the verge of entering that magical red tier. And one of the things I'm really worried about is that my gym is going to reopen. Um, and I know, you know, that's kind of funny, but it's really true. I'm a little worried. Uh, last year, I, I, as part of a New Year's resolution, I joined the gym. It was a small uh, gym, and it was, it was brand new, and it was kind of cheap. And I thought, well, you know, wasting $15 a month is not a big deal. 
and, and after COVID uh, happened, the gym closed and I haven't had to, you know, they haven't been charging me and I haven't had to feel guilty about not going. But now it's time to pay the piper, as it were, or pay the gym. And one of the things that's difficult about the gym is, one, I haven't been there in a long time, but two, I don't know if you have this fear, but I have this fear that I'm using the equipment incorrectly or, and not just incorrectly, embarrassingly incorrectly. Do you know what I'm talking about? You walk into the gym and, and there are these things that look like medieval torture devices, right? They have, I mean, they're, they're really scary looking. I feel like the gym guy who always, for some reason, calls me bro or chief or sport. I'm not really sure what that's about. But right, I, I have a feeling that he's going to strap me in there and torture me until I confess to being a witch, right? Like, that's what that looks like, right? These torture devices. And I'm always afraid. So I'm the guy, you see, like, I'll go up there and I'll look at the placard that's on there. And right, it's always got that, that big burly dude. And the muscles that it's working are red. And I'm like, well, I don't want my muscles red. Like, I don't, I don't want... I'm not necessarily sure I want this experience, but right, but I, but it's important, you know, God's given me this body. I really should take care of it. We've talked about this with holiness, right? So I, I feel like, you know, when the gym opens up, I want to do that. But honestly, I had an embarrassing experience before it closed because the truth is I, I, some, some of these new machines, I don't really understand. And I don't like, I look at the picture and the guy with the red chest muscles so I was using this piece of machinery and, and I was using it incorrectly. Like, and so I got to the machine and I began to really work out. And I mean, I was giving it my all. And then the guy comes and he says, bro, that's the towel dispenser. And so in that, like, because of that, like, I don't want to ever go back to the gym. And not only do I not want to go back to the gym, but I don't, I want to quit the gym, but but that guy, I have to wait until he dies before I go back, right? That's how embarrassing it was. I like, I immediately left and I went home and, you know, stopped by McDonald's. And, and so the thing about it is, you know, like we're, we're, we're afraid, right? I think that's one of the big fears when you go to the gym is you're afraid you're using this equipment incorrectly. Now, one of the things about the Bible is that we've honestly been using the Bible incorrectly, we have categorically misunderstood what the Old Testament was trying to accomplish. So we've so categorically misunderstood that we've actually dismissed the Bible. And I hear people say that all the time. I'm a New Testament Christian, which I think what they mean when they say that is, I don't read the Old Testament because the Old Testament it, is no use to us as Christians, right? As we're Christians, and those, those things in the Old Testament, we don't need to use them because G, we have Jesus. We don't need the Old Testament. But the problem is, is that we've categorically misunderstood what Leviticus was trying to do, what the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament laws, right? What the teaching of the Old Testament was trying to do. Now, we've talked about this in, in our sermon series a lot, and I want to say this again. I want you to say this with me. Say, holiness is life, right? Holiness is God's power of life in the world against the forces of death. That's what the Bible tells us, is that, that holiness, when, when Isaiah sees God, right, and the angels all around are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, Right, What they're saying is, is that God is the source of this powerful, radiating life. And God is doing battle with the forces of death in the world. And we see that, right? We see it in the Old Testament. We see God doing that. And in Jesus, we see it come to its fulfillment in him. We'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. But right now, what we need to understand, and we talked about over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about how the, the Bible, the, the Old Testament, these what we call laws, it's really probably better should be teaching or instructions, right? That these instructions in the Old Testament are actually meant to transform us. They're meant to, to help us to have disciplines and rhythms, routines and liturgies that actually point us to the kind of people that God was trying to make. 
right? Now, once we understand that, once we understand that the laws aren't a checklist that are meant to determine who's good and who's bad or who, who, whom God loves and whom God doesn't love, right? Remember, the people of Israel, God loved them. He saved them. He rescued them. And he says, now I'm giving you these instructions that are going to help you become a certain type of person. Last week, we talked about how the food laws are meant to help us become people who have our appetites under control, right? That, that don't allow our appetites to lead us away from God. And remember, those appetites are for food, obviously, for sex, and for money. Today, we're going to talk about how, particularly about money, but, but also about how worship is so, integra- in, uh, is so intimately connected and integrated with money. So I want you to see what's happening here. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I told you about my, uh, our pilgrimages to Dodger Stadium and about how I, my kids learn to love the Dodgers through routines and habits, what we call liturgies, right? But I want you to close your eyes with me now, and I want you to uh, allow yourself to be transported back uh, to the ancient Near East, to the time of the Old Testament. And so you can close your eyes and just relax a minute and just imagine you're walking and you have raised this uh, animal that you're going to take to sacrifice to the Lord, right? And you walk up the hill because the, the Jerusalem is a city on a hill, right? You're walking up and you're singing Psalm 120 and, through, uh, and maybe 121 all the way through Psalm 130. And you're singing the, these songs and you say, where does my help come from? I look to the Lord. And you sing songs about the Lord and how he's blessed you and how he's, how he's given you this, this land and how he's poured out his blessings on you. And then you get to, the, uh, to Jerusalem and you meet with all the other uh, people, your, your brothers and sisters, right? And, and we, once again, it's a celebration time, a time of joy. You go to, you take your offering to the priest and, and, and they take the blood and, they, and the blood, remember, is a symbol of the animal's life. And the animal never belonged to you. The animal belongs to God. And, and that, that blood that symbolizes its life is given back to God, right? Because God is the source of life. And then they take certain parts uh, of, the, of the sacrifice and they put it on the altar and the smoke from the altar rises and it's a, it's a particular smell, you know, I, I think Texas barbecue. It could be other smells too, right? But there are these smells that go, but let's think about what's happening, right? Your, your offering you bring it to the Lord, and, and just like your prayers go up to God, the smoke ascends to God. And what does the Leviticus say about that? It says that God is pleased with this. He's pleased with our prayers. He's pleased with our offering. He's pleased with our lives. Now imagine again how this would transform you if you did this every year, actually multiple times a year. This was written into your experience. All of a sudden, you begin to realize that worship, the worship that, that Leviticus talks about, that Deuteronomy talks about, it is meant to, to, to connect us to this God who is transcendent, this God who is, who is bigger than we ever imagined, who is, who is better than we ever imagined, who's more gracious, who's more compassionate it is, it is meant to be, these are disciplines, they're habits, they're liturgies, they're routines that draw our hearts towards God. That's what these, these experiences are about. And we generally, if you read Leviticus uh, 1, through, 1 through 6 and 7, are really about sacrifices, they're about worship. And we generally tend to think that sacrifices are are these things that when we do something really bad, we have to give God something. It's like we have, because he's really mad, so we give him something so they won't be mad anymore. But that's not really what the offerings do, right? What the offerings do, most of them have nothing to do with sin at all, right? They are times of celebration, times of joy, times of festival, times of harvest. There's different offerings like the thank offering and a well-being offering, 
right? A fellowship offering. These are times when we, we simply celebrate God's goodness to us. Now imagine this worship, this worship that has meant these practices that are meant to draw us to God. Now, I know what you're saying. There's still a little bit of barbaric nature to this, right? I mean, there's death and there's blood and there's burning. But let's think about what Paul says. If you look in Romans chapter 12, and uh, if you have your Bible, you can turn there with me. Let's see what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, a view of God's mercy to offer your bodies a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. Holy and pleasing to God. What what is Paul doing? Paul is saying the worship, the, the sacrifices of the Old Testament, they pointed to something bigger. They, yes, they were useful, and, and they helped shape, uh, you know, through liturgy. They helped shape through habit and routine. They helped shape Israel's heart towards God. Of course, now that Jesus has come, we we don't necessarily need those sacrifices, but to assume that sacrifice isn't a part of this is all wrong. Paul says, no, there's a new sacrifice, and it's you. It's your life. It's it's everything that you have and everything that you are and everything that you hope to be, that when we, we, we offer that to God, we can imagine in our minds, right? Remember, Paul is Jewish. Paul participated in all of the sacrificial offerings, Right, he knows that smell. He know he remembers that that Texas barbecue. Right, he remembers it, and he remembers how his heart was drawn to God through the prayers. And as that smoke rose up, right, his prayers rose up to God, and God accepted his prayers, and they were pleasing to God. And what does Paul say? He says, "Now I want you to present yourselves." as a sacrifice. And as the smoke, you can imagine the smoke rising, your prayers rising. As a matter of fact, in the book of Revelation, there's another talk again about how the the incense of the altar is rising to God and that those are the prayers of the saints. That once again, God is still using that imagery. Now we imagine, he says, he says, offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see, worship, and this is really, it's it's a very important thing. Worship meets our greatest need. It really does. Worship connects us to this God who is better than we ever imagined and bigger than we ever imagined and more powerful than we have ever imagined and, and holier than we ever imagined and more compassionate and more gracious, more loving, right? It's meant to connect us to him. It's meant that our lives go up and, and, and God is pleased with our lives with this offering that we give him. But it also does something else, Paul says. Paul says that worship, it's, it's, not a, it's not just an experience. It is an experience, but it's more than that. Paul says that very often in, in our modern world, we think that worship is, it's almost like a product that's meant to be packaged and consumed. But worship is an experience that transforms. What does Paul say? Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. You see, worship in the Old Testament, worship in the New Testament, worship in the kingdom that is coming, right? all of these, worship is meant to transform us. It is meant to unite us to God. Now, remember, we've t- we, we said this again, and I'm going to say it one more time. Say it with me. Holiness is life. Let's think about the Old Testament, right? The, the, this, that the people of Israel... Once again, when we read Leviticus, we hear it over and over again. Be holy, God says. Be holy, people, because I am holy. You, in Deuteronomy, we hear uh, what uh, Moses says to the people of Israel. He says, you are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. Right? You are the people. So what is God? So what's, how does this work? Let's think about this. 
remember, the instruction of Leviticus and Deuteronomy and what we call laws, right? What are they supposed to do? They are meant to be disciplines that transform us to become like God. That's what worship does. Worship is an experience that unites us to God, but also transforms us into his character. And God says, I want you to be holy like I'm holy. Remember, holiness is life. Holiness is is the power of life, the radiating power of life that, that goes out into the world to fight and to destroy the power of death. And so what is God saying to the people of Israel? He says, I want you to come and I want in, in, our, in this experience of worship, you're going to be transformed into my holiness. You're going to take some of my holiness, some of my life, and you're going to take that life out into the world and you're going to bring light where there is darkness. You're going to bring life where there is death. You will take my life into a dark and dying world. Because I'm holy, I want you to be holy. Because I am the source of life, I want you to take my life into a world. I want you to be the kind of people that bring life where there is darkness. I want you to be the kind of people that work in such a way that, that, there, that the world is so filled up with life, there is no place for death anymore. Now, what does that mean? That would be a great way to end a sermon, wouldn't it? You're like, yeah, I want to be an agent of life. I mean, think about what what we as a culture, what we value, we we value. We want to say, look, God, we we want to be people who make a difference in our world. We want to look at the world and see where there are children being being oppressed, children being sold into slavery, and we want to be the antidote to that. We want to go and find a way to take that death and bring life. We want to find a place where people are starving to death, and we want to be the people who eliminate, who destroy the power of death in our world, right? Most uh, most of us want that. We want to be people who make the world better, and see, this is, I think, one of the problems with our modern church is that we want to do those things, but by ignoring the Old Testament, we've actually taken away the disciplines, the liturgies, the habits, the routines that will help us grow. Remember, if God is the source of life, then everywhere there is death, his people should be fighting it. Now let's talk about worship and how it connects to generosity. I want you to look, because today, we remember, we, we said that, that, that these appetites, one of them is money, right? Worship is meant to transform how we think about money. And if you look with me, you can turn with me to Deuteronomy. Remember, it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's the fourth book in. I, I'm sorry, the fifth book in. Now, when we look at this, we see there's a very strange thing. And, and chapter 26 is beautiful, but it's strange to our way of thinking. He says in, verse 20, in chapter 26, he says, When you have entered the land that Yahweh your God is giving you as an inheritance and taken possession of it and settled in it, he says, I want you to take some of the first fruits of all that you produce from the soil of the land the Lord your God is giving you and put them in a basket. He says, I want you to collect your first fruits, what we would call your tithes. Right? He says, I want you to get, and he says, I want you to put them in a basket, and then I want you to bring them to the place your God will give you. And, and what he's talked about is Jerusalem, right, where the temple is. And then he says, I want you to say this I declare today that the Lord your God, um, to the Lord your God, that I have come to the land that Yahweh swore to our ancestors and gave us. And he says, and then the priest shall take the basket from you and set it down in front of the altar that the Lord your God is giving you, right? It, in other words, this is an offering to Yahweh, to our God who brought us into this land, who's been gracious and provided us with all these wonderful things. And then he says, and it's a great thing. It, this, is, it, this is actually one of the more famous passages in the Bible. He says, and then once you do this, you shall declare, my father was a wandering Aram man. And he went down to Egypt. And what, is, what essentially they do in these next verses is they tell Israel's story. They tell the story about how God chose Abraham 
to be a blessing to the whole world and about how Abraham went down into Egypt and his family. But then God, after the years of slavery, brought them out with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And he brought them into this land flowing with milk and honey. And he's poured out blessing upon blessing upon blessing. He is gracious when the people of Israel disobeyed God. He was gracious and he forgave them. Right? What is this? This is worship. This is us saying God has blessed us and we're offering to him the first fruits. Then a strange thing happens. Look down with me. He says in in, uh, chapter or verse 11, he says, Then you and the Levites and the foreigners residing among you shall rejoice in all the good things the Lord your God has given to you and to your household. He says, when you finish setting aside a tenth of all your produce in the third year, in the year of the tithe, you shall give it to the Levite, the, for, the foreigner, that, that word means sojourner, people who are not residents of Israel, but who live there. He says, I want you to give it to them, to the fatherless and to the widow, so they may eat in your towns and be satisfied. Not only that, I mean, what we see here is we see that worship is intimately connected to generosity. That they're two sides of the same coin, that they can't be separated out. That worship is not a separate experience from generosity, and generosity is not a separate experience from worship, but that the two coexist why? Let's think about that. Remember, what are the law, what are the, the instructions of Leviticus and Deuteronomy all about? They're about disciplines and habits that draw our hearts towards God and towards life. And how and what, what Leviticus and Deuteronomy are going to tell us over and over again, how can I love the God and worship the God who is the source of life and see my neighbor starving, starving to death? I can't do that. Those two things are incompatible, right? I must. If I worship the God of life, if I worship the God whose power radiates out and destroys death wherever it it finds it, then when I see my neighbor hungry, I must act because that's who God is. If God is the source of generosity and life, and when I worship him, I'm transformed into his likeness, then I will become generous. And these instructions are about me learning patterns and habits. Not only that, but remember I told you about those animals that they sacrificed? Those animals that they sacrificed, right? A family would bring, them, bring this animal, but most animals were too big for one family to consume all by themselves. So what did they do? They would bring the sacrifice to Yahweh But remember, Yahweh doesn't eat the sacrifice, right? The ancient pagan gods around Israel, they needed. In fact, that's why they created human beings in the first place, right? If you read ancient creation stories, the gods created human beings because they just didn't want to have to work for food. But God doesn't eat the sacrifice. You know who does? Families united together. People who have and people who don't. You see, generosity and worship are so intimately connected. They are integrated in ways that, and honestly, I have to admit, I struggle with generosity. Right? I've always been stingy. I've always been selfish. I don't know why my parents were great people. Right? I can't blame them. But I've struggled. But as I began to look at the instructions of the Old Testament, the instructions of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and by the way, the ones that were repeated in the New Testament, I begin to realize that our worship, my worship, should transform me into a generous person because that's who God is. Listen to what Paul says. Remember I told you Romans 12 was about worship, right? He says, offer your bodies a living sacrifice. Then come down here. He says, remember, once we've been transformed by the renewing of of our minds, once we've been in the presence of the life-giving God, he says, love must be sincere in verse 9. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. And share with the Lord's people who are in need. 
practice hospitality. He says, once you've been transformed, you will practice hospitality. Why? Because that's God's nature. That's God's nature. It's no surprise. Remember in Acts chapter 2, right? The, the, the early believers got together and the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them powerfully and they spoke in tongues and what a powerful worship event that was, right? Because they were connected to the living God and they were connected to each other in ways that are, that are, that are just supernatural, right? And I mean that in the most powerful sense. And then what happens immediately following that worship service? It says they begin to sell their possessions and give to anyone who had need. Why? Because worship and generosity are connected. Worship and generosity are connected. When we get into the presence of God, we take on his character and we become like him. So today, I look at my own life, and I really do. I'm not making this up. I struggle. I struggle with selfishness. I struggle with greediness. I struggle. I'm just not a generous person by nature. And I've always been amazed by people who are just generous. So what we need to do is we need to have disciplines, routines, habits, liturgies, that remind us that all that we have, all the blessings that we have in this life belong to God. It's one of the reasons why we give to our church. Every time we we give, we are reminded, God, everything I have belongs to you. This is a portion, uh, uh, it's a token, it's a reminder to me that it all belongs to you, right? That, That giving, that just that discipline of giving does that. But then we also realize that that, that discipline of giving, it, it frees us. It empowers us. It changes us. It, it, once we get used to giving, it becomes a habit. It becomes a routine. And then we begin to realize that we can be generous in other ways as well. Right? And many of the ways that we give to our church is, are, in fact, so that we can be generous. Right, so that we can be generous with missionaries, so we can be generous in, in our missions in Mexico and the Dominican Republic and our missions all around our community. So today, I'm going to ask you, what does your worship lead you to? How does your worship transform you? Is worship primarily something that just meets your needs and, and, and recharges your battery for the new week? Or, do, or, or are you intentional about your worship? Does it transform? Let's pray. Father, we ask you would make us like you. Transform us by the renewing of our minds. Make us generous. Make us holy. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for joining us in worship today. As a reminder, if you're looking for a place to worship in person, we have a worship service outdoors in our courtyard every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. If you decide to join us there, please wear a mask. However you decide to worship, we are so glad that you tuned in today and hope that you'll join us again next week.